profiling security uh, setting. All right, so part management. Um, this has been an area that has been um, a source of feedback in past platforms. So the key, the key thing is that in Windows um, Server 2003 and earlier platforms, the part range from which we assigned parts dynamically was 1025 to 5000, which conflicts with the um, actual registered parts that are assigned to a lot of applications. So if you actually look at um, a Windows Vista machine um, and you do a net stat, I'm not sure if I have any connection because I don't actually have an in a network connection, but I can also show you this um, from NetSH. If I show you, if I go to um, IPv4, uh, show dynamic port range for TCP. What you'll notice is that we're now assigning ports from the IANA specified range, meaning we start at 49K and we go up from there all the way to 64K. So if you had any registered ports in the lower area, first of all, we won't be conflicting with those. Um, the other thing is that not only will we not be conflict conflicting with those, but we also have more ports available for dynamic port assignment. On top of that, we also implemented support for randomizing port number assignments. So if you have an application and you'd like to sort of do a secure connect where it's harder to predict what port number your application is going to use when it's making a connection out, we introduced the socket option as the randomized port that will allow you on a per connection basis um, to basically say that you want a random port number assignment for your outgoing connection. So that, that's one set of capabilities around port management. The other set of capabilities has to do with applications that need, that essentially need to do either their own port management or that need support for securing their network ports. Um, so taking the first case category of, of applications, so you might have a conferencing application that, um, for instance, needs 100 ports and it's going to manage those ports itself. So we have support for doing that as well in the networking stack. The application can submit a runtime request for a block of ports. And if we have enough ports available and the application has the right privileges, we'll actually give back a block of those ports and the app can manage those on its own in parallel with the stack managing the managing app, uh, port numbers for everybody else. That addresses one style of application. Another style of application has to do with services that might be concerned about squatting. So you install, for instance, um, IIS on port 80 or you install um, RISC you know, the routing information protocol of port 520. And you want to make sure that when you connect to port 520, it's actually, you know, IIS or RIP that's there. Currently, if the process is not running, there's no, in the past, there wasn't really a good way to lock down that port. So what we've done now is that we've actually built in APIs in the IP helper API so that you can reserve ports statically um, ahead of time. So for instance, when you're installing an application, you can actually say, I need port 520 in order to run. Please lock down port 520 and don't give it to anybody else, even if I'm not actually running at that time. And once the application has done that, we give back a reservation token that the application can use in conjunction with its privileges to obtain that part at runtime if it needs to and use it to bind its parts and accept connections. So a quick look back at what I just said about how port management has changed. There's the IANA compliance for registered and ephemeral ports. That's something that um, security solutions in particular should probably be aware about. You're going to see different behavior in the port management space. Also, as applications start to take advantage of the new support for randomizing ports, that's going to change the behavior you see coming out of applications. Um, and then finally, for the port reservation is something that's really useful for application vendors. So now I'll switch the gears completely and talk a little bit about how we approached the um, challenges around TCP performance and then handling intensive workloads. So a lot of our work and a lot of our thinking went into this area. So core TCP performance, to understand some of the things that we've done there, it's useful to know a little bit about flow control. So I'll breeze through this since I'm guessing a lot of people here probably know, know about this. There are two algorithms that kind of determine TCP performance. The first is flow control, which really runs on the receiver and is used to manage the flow of packets from the sender to the receiver. 
The second is congestion control, which runs on the sender and which is used to ma make sure that the network doesn't get overloaded by a particular TCP connection. So flow control first. Um, how it works, the receiver advertises a window. The sender, the window is the number of bytes that the receiver is willing to accept. The sender can send that many bytes, and then it has to stop and wait for an acknowledgement from the receiver before it can send more. So that's a basic idea. Now, what window should the receiver advertise? The ideal window is the product of the bandwidth and the delay. What does that mean? Well, you can model the path between a sender and the receiver as a pipe. The receive window capacity is essentially a particular volume cross-section of that pipe. So in this case, I've shown what, how much of, a, of this particular pipe would be used by the particular receive window that's being advertised by this receiver. So the length of the pipe is the delay, and the cross-section of the pipe you can think of as the bandwidth, how many bytes you can send at a given instant. So now if you take this receive window and you overlay it on top of a pipe that looks very different, you get a very, very different throughput. Um, so now if your receive window is fixed, this is the kind of behavior that you see. You go from one, from a network where the receive window is fine to a different network and your throughput tanks. The basic, so this is a numerical way of looking at what I just showed pictorially. So you can see what the ideal window would be for various paths with various you know, speeds and um, round trip delays. And then you can also see what the capacity is that would be utilized by a default window, for instance, on uh, an operating system that doesn't have any dynamic behavior around its window uh, size, and that just uses, say, the 64K default, which is the maximum that you can use by default in TCP. The way that we approach this problem is that, first of all, we know that we need to be able to adjust the receive window dynamically. So every single connection that's negotiated by um, the Windows Vista TCP staff will try and negotiate window scaling up front. And that'll give us some some sort of leeway in terms of how we can grow and shrink our windows later on in the connection. The second thing that we do is that we estimate the capacity of the pipes between, uh, between the receiver and the sender. And that's a fairly tricky uh, problem to solve because when you are the receiver and you're not necessarily emitting packets, your only source of information on what the pipe's capacity is is what arrives from the sender. And so we, we put in quite a bit of research on getting a good algorithm for estimating capacity in this environment. The final thing that we do is that we vary our window advertisement based on that estimate that we generate. Now, if you think back to um, the pictures that I showed you of the two different pipes, you can see that clearly there's quite a bit of room for improvement you know, in, in moving from one network to another if you have this kind of capability. And, what we've, and that's, in fact, what we've seen. So, our Microsoft.com folks actually in testing the particular path that they had between uh, Taquila and, uh, and the Bay Area, um, a pipe that they had never been able to saturate in the past, right out of the gate got a 40x improvement um, just for, for plain TCP throughput. Now, not all applications see that level of dramatic improvement, and a big part of the reason is that Applications typically, a lot of applications have their own flow control that they're doing on top of TCP. So for instance, the request response application sends a request, waits for a response, sends another request, waits for another response. If you can imagine the request traversing that humongous pipe and the response sort of making its way back over that humongous pipe, it's like the problem of leaving the pipe idle. So the way to solve that problem is to build pipelining into the application so that it can send multiple requests to sort of prime the pump and then the responses can come back and keep the pipe full at all, at all times. An example of an application that has that behavior is SMB 1.0. So by default, SMB 1.0 doesn't have any pipelining capabilities enabled. So when you move from, say, a corporate network with low delay to a, a high-speed network, you don't get very good performance. With SMB 2.0, which is enabled by default in Windows Vista, it actually does have support for pipelining, and we've done a bunch of work on tuning SMB 2.0 performance so that when you compare SMB 1.0 on the Windows XP stack to SMB 2.0 on the Windows Vista stack, we get an even more dramatic improvement than what we got just with raw three TCP performance. So there we go up to 46x improvement. The first thing that happens, you know, when we enable something like this is people want to know how to control it. Um, so what we did is we actually have that capability built in. So if I show, um, let's see.
we have a bunch of global settings that can control CCP's behavior. One of them is the auto-tuning level. So by default, this is set to normal, but on particular networks, admins might be worried that a, a single laptop can actually now actually saturate a gigabit link without much effort. So if they want to control that, we actually give them a way to do that. Either you can do it in the command line, or you can also do it using group policy and just roll that out to an entire enterprise. So that, that, that's a quick look at one feature that we did for CCP performance that we that's really targeted at end users. Now I'm going to switch gears and look at some of the stuff that we've done around handling intensive workloads that matters more to high performance applications, whether it's web servers, you know, proxies, et cetera. The ways to think about handling, tag, tackling these workloads is there are multiple dimensions of scalability. One is bandwidth scalability, another is memory scalability, and so on and so forth. So looking at bandwidth scalability, what are the challenges? Well, at a gigabit, you have a budget for how much time you can spend processing every single packet that comes off the wire. At a gigabit, you have about 16 microseconds. And if you spend more than 16 microseconds per packet, you're going to fall behind and you start, start dropping packets. At 10 gigabits, that goes down to 1.6. And at 100 gigabits per second, you're down to about 160 nanoseconds that you can spend processing every single CCP segment that comes off the wire. So now if you want to build a stack that can scale to these levels, clearly you have to kind of rethink some of the things that, some of the ways that we approach the problem. So we've done a number of things. So we process multiple packets at once. We offload checksum computation and verification because that's not really something we have, we have to do with the host CPU. And then we offload actually chopping up segments um, onto the wire. Um, but it's still not enough to get to 100 gigabit throughput. So how do we get there? Well, we actually have to take TCP processing and move it off the host operating system so that the only thing that we deal with in the operating system is handling requests. So for instance, a send, a receive, we can deal with the rate at which requests arrive. It's just dealing with the rate at which packets come off the network that becomes challenging. So how do we get to the level where we're dealing with requests rather than with dealing, dealing with packets? Well, we build in the intelligence into every single la layer of the stack such that it looks at the state that it maintains and it has the ability to package up that state and pass it to a piece of hardware. So that happens at the CCP layer, at the IP layer, and at the um, sort of ARP layer, if you will. Um, so now what happens is that looking at what happens when we, when we look at a connection and we figure out, okay, we're starting to fall behind on this connection and we have an offload capable adapter, we need to move this off the operating system and into hardware. So what happens? So we initiate an offload in attempt, TCP packages up the state for the connection and passes it down to IP, which packages up the state for IP and passes it down to ARP, which packages up the state for ARP and passes it down to the network adapter. And then the network adopter can either accept the offload or it can reject it. If it accepts the offload, what happens is that we then percolate back up the stack, kind of doing a two-phase commit. If there have been any changes to the state on the way down, this is our chance to fix up those changes and notify the NIC that, say, for instance, um, the algorithm has changed or, um, or we have you know, a different uh, sequence number now because we accepted some data while we were in the process of offloading. So, from that point forward, our state machines are synchronized between the operating system and between hardware. And we also have a channel where we can communicate changes to that state. So the key thing is that this is great.